This is Tommy Outdoors 88, and our guest today is Peter Kearns from environmental charity Scotland The Big Picture, and we're going to talk about rewilding. Enough said! Enough said! We're going to talk about whole deal, wolf, lynx, beaver, land use, conflict, everything. Peter is a well-known figure, so I don't think uh, I need to do any more introductions. Uh, so just before I let you enjoy this episode of the podcast, as always, remember that you can find a video version of this podcast on Tommy Outdoors YouTube channel. And on that channel, not only a podcast, but lots of more of educational uh, outdoorsy stuff. So head on to YouTube, find Tommy Outdoors and subscribe. And that's it. Uh, enough of the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Kearns and rewilding Scotland. Peter, welcome to Tommy Outdoors. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm really glad uh, that you're here with us today because uh, the subject of rewilding is something that has come up uh, in the podcast many times. And that's something that is, that is extremely interesting to me personally. Um, and I made some notes what I want to talk to you about. And there is no way we're going to cover everything because there's like a whole page of it. And, and I want to go deep into, into some of these subjects. And obviously when people are tuning in to listen to us for an hour or uh, close to two hours, they want us to go deep. So I'm going to prioritize that starting with stuff that interests me the most selfishly. It's my podcast after all. Peter, but just to set up the scene, just to set the scene, you are the executive director of Scotland, a big picture. That's a charity, as I understand. So can you introduce the organization and, and yourself to, to us, to our listeners, tell us how it started, what it is, what you do, what are the goals? Okay, uh, so briefly, myself and my business colleague, Mark Hamblin, have been involved with um, conservation photography, conservation journalism, if you like, for 15 years, I guess, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and we ran a, a social enterprise, a not-for-profit organization effectively reporting on and documenting and showcasing um, environmental stories all over the world. Over the years, that's gradually focused down specifically to rewilding and, and in recent years, specifically down to Scotland, simply because we feel that's where we can tell our stories most effectively. We know the landscape physically, but we also hopefully know the landscape culturally, politically, socially. Um, so that puts us in a really strong position to tell well-informed, compelling rewilding stories about Scotland's rewilding journey. Um, just to rewind a little bit on that, about 18 months ago, um, the two of us, along with our small team of about five or six, decided we wanted to get involved more with um, practical rewilding to make more of a physical difference. Fast forward, long story, but we decided that the best route to do that was to become a charity, which we did. So we now have three um, sort of objectives really to our work. Rewilding advocacy is one, wildlife comeback is two, and rewilding and people. I think, you know, rewilding is often framed in the context of, of wildlife. And I see you've got a, a wolf t-shirt on today, so we maybe come on to that. But, you know, really rewilding more than anything is about people and their attitudes and beliefs and, and, and priorities in life. So, you know, to talk about rewilding and exclude people um, it is, is pointless because that's really what it revolves around. Yes, and, and this, is, this is, you know, you mentioned that you know the landscape culturally, and I guess this is where, where the, uh, the whole discussion pivots around, you know, people who are in general, those who are pro-rewilding and these who are, who are against the rewilding. So I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, and you, and you mentioned rightfully that people needs to be included in that. How you're, how, how big of a challenge that is, uh, and, and do you have like a, you know, right of the bat, negative 
negative attitude because I, I noticed that when you mentioned rewilding, uh, a lot of people just shut off immediately. They don't even want to hear about it and they bringing all these arguments. My, my favorite is like, uh, which m you might want to comment on, oh, what's rewilding? There's nothing like rewilding. We're talking about restoration. About, and they kind of like latch on into, you know, semantics and the word. And it's like, okay, that's, that's really like easy way out. Now I'm going to debate the word rather than the concept. That's one, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's people's perception of it and understanding of it is, is pivotal to its acceptance. Um, we work very hard at, at reframing what we think rewilding means, and maybe we'll come to that. Um, but people's perceptions and attitudes are, are absolutely critical here. I think there are, for us, there are two words at, at the heart of this issue. Um, and this issue really is one of not only ecological change, but, but cultural and social change. This this concept requires us to think differently, to change our perspective. The first word is, is that word change. Generally speaking, human beings don't, don't react well to change. They're not particularly receptive to it, especially, and this is important, especially when they perceive that that change is being imposed upon them from an external source. And, and then of course, what happens as a consequence of that, all of these tribal um, stereotypes come to the fore. You know, the people behind rewilding, they're, they're left-wing liberalists, they're bunny huggers, they're vegans, they're, you know, <laughs> tree huggers, they're all of this sort of thing. And, and, and of course, from the rewilder's point of view, all of those that are opposed to, to it are, are stereotyped accordingly into tribes. And, and the truth is, in my experience anyway, those tribal labels are, are really very, A, A, they're not helpful, and B, they're not particularly accurate. You know, we deal with a lot of farmers and gamekeepers and gillies and landowners. And yes, you're right. There are those that are vehemently opposed to rewilding for all sorts of reasons. But equally, not all of them are. And some of them are really very progressive in their thinking. So I think it, it's not helpful to generalize the us and them because there isn't an us and them. There's a continuum. The other word that, that's critical in this is the word control. You know, we've grown used as a society to controlling the landscape to our own ends for forever, really. Uh, and rewilding, to a degree, asks us to relinquish that control, or at least some of it, back to nature. And if you're a land manager, by definition, you manage your land according to your own set of principles and motivations. And rewilding asks you to loosen your grip of that. And that, that's pretty scary for some people. So change and control are two words I think are really at the heart of this cultural divide, debate, discussion, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, that's interesting. So maybe uh, let's clarify that. And you talk about control and you're talking about managing. And I had that discussion with, with other people because in, 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 in my view, rewilding, let's use that term. For, for, and let's, let's everyone understand how we go, like rewilding in itself is a form of land management, right? It's not like, I'm not gonna manage anything, I'm just gonna leave it out. This is how I understand. So you can, so you can if I'm a land manager, I'm, I need to make an active decision to manage that piece of land as a wilderness. Right, so 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 th this is like. Would you would you see that the rewilding is a form of land management in itself? Yes and no. Um, I, I think that we're. I can only speak for Scotland. I I, I know. I think that that Ireland is in a particular in, in a in a very similar situation. Yes, we we are starting at, at such a low point from an ecological point of view. We're we're really pretty low on the scale. So the level of dewilding that has taken place for decades, centuries even, it is su to such a degree that we have to, as you say, take those decisions to intervene, to manage, to kickstart ecological processes. So yes, it is an active ma land management decision, you're quite right. But ultimately, I would argue that the objective um, in the future is to let go, or at least in part to let go, to let natural processes shape and govern the landscape. And I think that's probably what differentiates rewilding 
from traditional conservation. The fact that it has no predetermined outcome, there's no prescription on the table as to what that land should look like in 20, 50, 100 years. We don't know, we let nature take its course, but to, 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 to arrive at that point, we have to intervene and say, okay, this is where we are, we need to take actions X, Y, and Z to allow those processes to unfold and then develop. So ultimately, I would say it's a hands-off approach without too much management, but in the short term, absolutely, it's a land management prescription. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, am wa- I am wondering, um, because surely what comes to play here is a uh, area that we're talking about. And this is a, another argument that is quite often like, oh, it's too small or it's too big, or, right? Um, is it really possible? Because they, again, we, we, let, let's focus and let's talk about the context of Scotland and Ireland, where effectively we're talking about the patches of the land. How, how that would be possible without first acquiring a kind of like a fairly large amount of land that is not divided by, by anything. I, I, I think because even, we, and we're gonna talk about wolves no doubt shortly, but often the argument is like, oh, you know, like wolves doesn't really need like this vast wilderness. They can, you know, coexist with humans. They are gonna be kind of like sneaking around. And so that doesn't see, that doesn't uh, look like hands off approach. It, it sounds like a very much, you know, we coexist. It's, it's nothing like a wilderness. On the other hand, and I think this is the, 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 the point where especially farmers or, or communities, long established communities are just, just going ballistic when, when you say about that, you know, like, oh, this old land, you know, rewild, which is an argument I understand because for generations, people were kind of grabbing the land of the nature, right? Fighting that wilderness and turning that into pasture and turning that into, you know, great sheep, cattle, thanks to which we could focus on healthcare and universities and space flight and all that. And now the, there, 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 there are people come like air, air quotes, rewilders coming in and say like, you know what? Everything that you've done for the past generation, you actually got it wrong. Now we need to reverse that, right? And I understand why people go like, what? Like, ah, right? So how you, how you reconcile this context with like, you know, ultimately we want this land to be off, off hands and, and nothing is happening. Now, no, no, nothing is happening, but we're not intervening. We're not managing actively. Yeah, uh, all, all very valid points. Um, there's, a, there's a few questions in there. So maybe if I could try and tease them out. Sure. Um, to, go, to go back to your first question about area, um, I, I think, again, this, this to some degree comes down to how you define rewilding. And, you know, if you speak to 10 different people, you'll get 10 different answers. The purists would argue that, you know, you can't, quant- you can't qualify anything as rewilding unless it's, it's a huge open area with the complete portfolio of native species functioning as a, as, a, as a complete ecosystem and, importantly, in the absence of people. There are rewilders that, that have that vision. Um, in the real world, I would argue that's not possible, even if it was desirable. So there are diff- for me anyway, there are different levels of rewilding. There are landscape scale projects. Now, whether those are called rewilding or ecological restoration or nature recovery, personally, I don't care what you call it, as long as it takes us along the wilding journey, shall we say that? So as long as it takes us from where we are to somewhere that is better from an ecological point of view, but also from a social and an economic point of view. And that really is the starting point for us when we look at any sort of rewilding area or an area that is being considered for rewilding, whether it's 10 acres, 100 acres or, or 100,000 acres, can this landscape or seascape be improved ecologically? Can we do better with it? Not only from an ecological point of view, but can this area benefit a wider range of people that are presently benefiting from it? So for me, it's not about looking back and and it's certainly not about pointing the finger of blame 
and, and as you allude to, suggesting that somebody's life's work has been, has been meaningless. That, that's not helpful and not realistic. We are where we are. For me, rewilding is all about looking forward. It's a solutions-focused approach to some of the ecological and social and economic problems that especially the rural areas of Scotland, and I guess the same with Ireland, presently face. Um, so I, I think we could, we could split hairs all day long about what rewilding is and what it isn't. I, I think that's a waste of energy. I think there's a lot of good habitat and species restoration work to be getting on with before we worry too much about what the word means and whether it's socially acceptable or not. It, it, it's one of those things, along with a few others, that could really drain the energy and passion out of this, out of this movement, shall we say. Yeah, I, I almost feel like the, the, using the word is counterproductive. Like everybody who work, works on rewilding should, first rule, don't mention rewilding. That's, that's, that's going to open some doors. Can you, can you uh, tell us, that, can you enumerate a few of these problems? You mentioned that there are some problems with, for, for the ecological landscape and people. Can you, can you just uh, tell us what are the biggest ones, biggest problems that could be addressed through? Yeah, I, I mean, at, at a physical level, certainly in Scotland, um, you know, the fact is that 25%-ish, a quarter of the Scottish landscape is, is dedicated almost exclusively to either open hill deer stalking or, or driven grouse shooting. So you have huge tracts of land that have a very specific and narrow use. And, and I would argue benefit, benefit a, a very specific and narrow range of people. So again, you know, I would look at those landscapes, not, not from necessarily a rewilding point of view, just from a, at a societal level and say, you know, is that in, in 2020 when we're facing Uh, a global climate breakdown, global biodiversity loss, is that a sustainable and optimal use of that area of land? And, and I, I think, you know, even the most ardent supporters would have to agree that in the present, in a modern context, the answer to that is, is, has got to be no. There have to be better ways of utilizing that land to achieve ecological, social and, and economic objectives. So the physical land use system in Scotland, the, the pattern of ownership in Scotland that has been entrenched for two, three hundred years now, that presents a physical and legislative barrier to moving rewilding forward at a landscape scale in many areas. That is not to say that all grouse moors are barren, you know, and, and devoid of life. That's not the case at all. And the same for, for deer forests. But I would argue they're nowhere near as ecologically rich as they once were and could be again. And also that in, in many cases, they don't support anywhere near the number of people they once did and could again. So for me, it's all about what are the opportunities here to improve this landscape, both ecologically, but as, as I say, also socially and, and economically. So that is one physical barrier. But I think going back to your question, probably the, the, the biggest barrier is a, is, a, is a philosophical one. You know, going back to the change in control, we've just grown used to the landscape the way it is. We celebrate it, we cherish, we cherish it. Actually, perversely, we pay to conserve it in its degraded state. Um, you know, we normalize a degraded ecosystem mm -hmm. because we don't know any better. We've never known any better. And I think, you know, what's interesting in the last maybe 10, 15 years is, is well, conversations like this, really, that are starting to take place because people are looking at the, the status quo and, and questioning it and, and wondering what Scotland or Ireland should look like or, or could look like. So I think ecological awareness and understanding is really opening up the conversation And I think it's very quickly and, and excitingly moving from a conversation that, you know, environmentalists or rewilders have into one that mainstream society is having. You know, I now, I now hear the word rewilding mentioned by government ministers, mentioned by policymakers, mentioned by celebrities, you know. So it's becoming a normal conversation. Five years ago, 
you know, it definitely wasn't a, a normal conversation. So the goalposts are moving philosophically and psychologically at a societal level very quickly. And, and I think that's an encouraging sign. Yes, that's, that's, that's no doubt uh, that, that everything goes, goes that direction. Um, okay, uh, question about, uh, you know, maybe not a question, but comment about normalizing the, how the landscape looks like. And the, like, I run a survey on, on my Twitter account and on, on uh, Instagram showing a picture of a, of a hillside. And the question is like, what do you see? You see beautiful, stunning views? Or are you seeing, you know, wet desert? And, and it was like roughly 50-50, which might, it might be, you know, obviously there's a bias of people who are following me and I, I, I get that. But I, I can relate to that personally because when I first uh, came to Ireland, and, and I was walking on the hills, I had the same like, oh, it's beautiful, it's fantastic, it, right? And then I, I reached the uh, top of the hill and there are sheep. And I'm like, oh, like it, it's something like, well, I wouldn't expect to find a sheep here. And then it's like, well, what's, what other wildlife I can, and I, it was, you know, blatantly obvious to me, like I, I won't find any wildlife, maybe the odd fox or maybe a frog or, uh, or, or maybe something like that. And then, to some extent, um, uh, I said that before in the podcast because I, I, I had a, a number of times in the podcast, Porig Fogarty, who is an Irish Wildlife Trust uh, campaign officer, and I said, like, Porig, you ruined that for me. Because no, no, it's a, it's a wet desert. It's a, it's a uh, you know, ecologically broken ecosystem. What previously was so beautiful to be, it's like, oh, yeah, you, you, you ruined that, all, all that to me. Um, but I guess you're right. It's it's a matter of choice as well, right? Uh, what we choose to do, and 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 then that change because people who are running sheep on those hills, they need to do something about it, right? That's the biggest problem. Yeah. No. I, I mean, I you know, I went through a similar process to, to you. I, I know Porig. It wasn't him that that shattered my illusion, but but you know, it's a similar a similar process. I, I think travel is a, is a great educator. You know, when you when you look over the the horizon, as it were, uh, maybe travel to other countries and and see what is possible, um, and then when you learn a little bit about the history of, of places like Scotland and Ireland, you start to understand not only what has happened but but why it's happened. Um, I, I mean, all of that, you know, is water under the bridge. We we can't change history. There's no point in pointing the finger of blame at sheep or deer or grouse or, or the people that manage, it, it's irrelevant, it's gone. But I think what we can do is, is, is use history or historical context to inform the future and to at least show us what, what, could, what could happen, what, what is possible. So um, yeah, it, it's a difficult one. And, and I, I'm trying to think of the, I think it was Aldo Leopold that said something along the lines of, you know, a little bit of ecological education condemns you to living in a world of wounds or something like that. And, and it's exactly that, you know, when you become aware of the, the, the shortcomings, so to speak, of a landscape, it, it's difficult to ignore it. And, and you, you tend to then contextualize it in a very negative way. Um, I recognize beauty in, you know, in, in, in a traditional landscape, in, in, a, in, a, in a, a, a cultural landscape. But I also yearn for something better and richer and more diverse and more vibrant and more exciting. And I yearn for that at a personal level, but I also genuinely think it will be beneficial on all manner of levels. And actually, you don't have to give a hoot about pine martins or pine trees or pine hoverflies, but presumably you do give a hoot about the purity of the air that your children breathe, the, the clarity of your water, the fact that you don't want your home or business flooding every three years. These are very practical issues that are intricately tied in with the way we use our landscapes, especially in the uplands. So, you know, there are, there are rewilding, it, it tends to focus on, on, on bountiful wildlife and aesthetics and all of that. And that's a, that is a part of it. But at a very pragmatic level, there are 
real solutions to be to be sought from rewilding principles and rewilding actions. So I would argue that this is a consideration not for the likes of you and I, but for wider society at large. Yes, yes. And like you said, it seems like that converse, at least we started that conversation and, and um you know, I often make that argument to people who are um, opposing rewilding and they don't even want to hear about it. And um, one of those groups, which is especially close to my heart, and like you said, not always, because this is not black and white, but in general, I feel like hunters are the group who are uh, uh, on the wrong side of rewilding, so to say. And on, and I'm wondering why, because... Um, I think many hunters looking at, uh, on YouTube at videos of, you know, hunts on the pub, uh, public lands or this the, the capital W wilderness where you can go in and camp for three days and it's like, wow, right? And then, so everybody looks to that and say, this is super cool. I would like to do that. But then when transferred on the local ground, uh, like, ah, no, not really, you know, the farmers, like, you know, what about these wolves? They're going to eat all our deer, which in fact is the same discussion in the, in the United States. So I, I think that it's good to have these conversations and, and it's, it is, you know, I agree with everything you said to show people the benefits and this is not necessarily like destroying completely what you've been doing so far. I want to switch gears a little bit now. And since I already mentioned hunters, can you laid out for our listeners and viewers the situation with deer in Scotland. That's a, that's a big subject and it's a, it's a contagious, uh, I, I guess, because obviously I, I listened to many other podcasts where it was discussed from all, all different angles. And um, what, what is especially interesting to me is that not long ago, I had a discussion about uh, where we mentioned rewilding in Scotland, Scottish context. And I heard like, well, in Scotland, rewilding is all about trees, which is surprising to me. But then it was like, OK, because, you know, the deer all ate all the trees. So we need to kill all the deer. So we have a trees, but the deer is iconic species. Da, 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 da. You know, the you know, the so can you lay it out from your perspective, how how that situation looks like? Um, yes, it, 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 it's complex and it, and it is it is contentious to some degree. Um, I mean, the reality of it is that, you know, deer numbers in Scotland are roughly around about 400,000. That, that's the sort of latest red deer this is. And then more or less the same number again of, of roe deer. So we, we're talking somewhere in the range of, of three quarters of a million um, native deer in, in Scotland. Um, and of course, we have no natural predators, you know, wolves and lynx and bears are, are long gone. So the natural pressure on deer numbers have been, has been absent for, for many, many decades, centuries. Um, coupled with that, on the back of the Victorian social trend uh, for sport shooting, deer, salmon and grouse in particular, deer numbers were, or red deer in particular, were seen as an asset, as a landowner. The, the more game you had, the more shootable game you had on your estate, the higher the capital value of the land. So historically, that, that ethos is, is embedded. And so although most deer managers or land managers would recognize, well, all of them recognize the need for deer to be managed, what that management looks like in terms of numbers culled in a given year and how it's done and what time of year it's done it is a huge point of debate. And, and essentially, you have the tension, as you alluded to, between the sort of ecological perspective, which suggests deer are, are at such levels that the, the carrying capacity of the land has been exceeded and that, you know, natural vegetation succession is impossible in, in the, with, with, the, with the densities of deer in some areas as they are. And then you've got the flip side, the, the traditional view, if you like, where there's a, there's a reluctance to reduce deer numbers certainly to the, to, the, to the densities required for natural tree regeneration. In numerical terms, again, I'm generalizing, but you, you probably need to get red deer down to something like five per square kilometer to allow the ability of vegetation and trees in particular to, to regenerate. In some areas of Scotland, that figure is 60 per square kilometer. 
in many areas, it hovers around 20 to 30. So although there is an ongoing program of deer management, deer culling, what that looks like in reality for, you know, varies from one perspective to the other. So that's where the tension lies. We are now at a point where we are, we are potentially going to make it a legislative obligation for deer managers to reduce deer densities in some areas. There are already policies in place. Um, and, and I would add to that that this has already been attempted five or six times in the last 60, 70 years. So uh, again, you know, in the melting pot, there's, a, there's an ecological consideration. There's a, there's a cultural and a social and an economic consideration. And then poured on the top of that, there's a political consideration. So it makes that melting pot pretty, pretty complex. Um, rewilders, or some rewilders anyway, have come along and said, look, the problem will be solved overnight if we bring wolves back. Now, first of all, <laughs> that's not an easy process in itself. I mean, physically, it's very easy, but culturally, it's not. And, and wolves are not some sort of silver bullet. You know, they're not going to all of a sudden regulate deer numbers overnight even if wolves were present in the numbers that, you know, the Scottish people are likely to tolerate. And, and I'm guessing at something like 500, it's going to take a hell of a long time for wolves to chomp their way through three quarters of a million red deer. So yeah, yeah there's no easy answer to any of this. And again, it's, it, it, it's a symbol of um, a new way of thinking merging into traditional perspectives and, and there's a there's a you know there's an interface between those two interest groups, and there's a tension around that, and and I would say that progress is being made towards a sustainable solution, but it's slow and it's and it's difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that that's a that's a uh, argument that's being heard quite often and uh, about the wolves and uh, like you mentioned and what I what I heard as well that that no amount of wolves will will address deer problem anytime soon because there's so many of them and uh, other interesting comment that, that i might throw in here uh, was when a couple of years ago i was in in poland um and i was talking with one of the uh well gamekeepers i guess to to use the term uh in poland and i was showing him a photos of the red deer from ireland not from scotland from ireland and i said look like this right and he looked at them as like uh, yeah, nice. Like for Ireland, they're nice, right? And I was like, okay. And he brought the the rack of of the red deer that he had in the home. It was like the biggest freaking rack set of antlers I ever see. The mass on him, that was just unbelievable. And I said, like, what? So why do you think? Why do you think that deer are so? You know what? What? You know, my question was like, what those deer are missing in Ireland? And he, without even second of thought, predators, mm. predators. Right, like natural selection. You, 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 this is this is it. Like if the, if the deer, like you mentioned, they have no natural predators other than human, and that's obviously argument. Like oh, we have this, um, but that's that's one of the arguments that even if you're a deer lover and you love deer and you love stalking deer, probably the quality of the deer and the heads and whatever the term is used will increase with natural processes with natural pressure from the predators and and so on and we know that for example elk tends to hang on to their antlers longer with the presence of wolves because they're they're probably you know using that using that for for the defense now just just sorry to interrupt you, Tommy. i mean there's an irony in there because one of the arguments around for example out of season shooting mm -hmm. or night shooting of deer which some, some land managers do, um, is that there are welfare considerations, you know, so you're shooting hinds out of season when they have calves inside them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and I kind of get that to a degree, but the flip side of that is that Scotland's deer generally, I would say, are, are, are subject to pretty poor welfare standards in as much that they are forced to live on the open hill with very minimal shelter, very poor nutrition for most of the year. In many areas, their natural woodland shelter is fenced to keep them out. <laughs> so, you know, and as a result, we have, as, as you allude to, a, a effectively a stunted version 
of, of the red deer that are found not only on the continent, but elsewhere in the UK. I, I would argue that in itself is a welfare issue. You know, we are treating the deer um, poorly, you know, and, and I think if you, if, you, if you turned up today and proposed, for example, a red deer reintroduction, and as a consequence of that, you had to do a habitat assessment, an ecological viability study, so to speak, you would probably conclude that Scotland isn't a suitable country, ecologically speaking, <laughs> for red deer to prosper. And yet here we are with 400,000. Now, again, that's a sweeping generalization. There are lots and lots of exceptions to that. But I hear this argument about, you know, welfare, deer welfare, a lot. And, and yet I just sort of look at them and think, you know, we've been treating these animals very, very poorly in terms of where we allow them to live and how we feed them or mm -hmm. how they feed naturally for centuries. Um, so, yeah, there, 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 are, there are inconsistencies and, and, and ironies in, in all of these situations. Yeah, that's a very that's a very good point. That's a very good point, especially that the woodland is fenced off. Because if it wasn't, the deer would eat that food <laughs> because there's too too many of them. Um, I just want to uh, wind back a little bit um, to one point that you made earlier. That I'm sure you 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 you, you can expand on that and, and, and have some interesting comments. You mentioned that the purest rewilders are striving for just no human interaction. Um, and I must say like as much as I am, and uh, you know, people who know me know that I am for rewilding in general. I liked, I love the idea. I would love to have a wilderness areas with a, with a many creatures on it. But I have a problem with this no humans interaction. This is like oh, almost, you know, it's like, it's, and again, it was, it was kind of a heated conversation. Is conservation even possible without humans? That there's no conservation without humans? And then the other argument, like, you know, how can you even make that argument? It is this and that and something else. And that made me think. And I came to the conclusion like that imagine that there is a massive area of pristine wilderness with all the animals and everything in there. But the caveat is you can't get there. You just, it's, uh, you're, it's not for you. You can't even go there. And you know what? I'm not interested. Like selfishly, I'm like not interested. Like why? Like we might as well tell ourselves that this is, there is somewhere, something like that, but you can't even go there. How do you, how, what's our, what are your views on this? You know, no humans versus humans versus interaction with the humans. You know, like to me, the whole point is so I can interact with that, pristine nature you know whether it's camping or hunting and fishing or whatever that is yeah no again it's a very valid question and, and very pertinent um i mean if you go back to the sort of founding principles of rewilding there was this term that was coined and i was desperately trying to think of the, of the person that did it but I, I can't um and the definition probably 30 years ago around rewilding was was called cause corridors and carnivores, cores spelt C-O-R-E-S. So the idea is that you would have core areas of, of wilderness where I won't say humans were, 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 were prohibited, but certainly weren't encouraged. So these were pretty pristine areas whereby ecological functionality was at its, was its, its optimum. And that would effectively um, allow animals and vegetation communities to develop and then to disperse via these corridors um, into the wider environment. And then carnivores would be the sort of oil in the engine, if you like, to lubricate that whole process. So cores, corridors, and carnivores, the three Cs, were the kind of founding principles of, of rewilding. I think if you move on, you know, to, to, to modern days, to 20 years, uh, to, to the year 2020, irrespective of whether you think areas without people are desirable, or, or even necessary, the reality is, for reasons you've just alluded to, it's not practical. So do we, do we suspend our aspirations for a wilder landscape in, in holding on to this notion that we must, at all costs, create a peopleless wilderness? Even if that is your view, you're going to take a hell of a long time and go through a, 
tortuous battle to achieve that. I would argue, look, we live in a, in a pretty crowded world. We have aspirations to travel, to experience, to benefit from, to exploit the natural environment. We're not doing that particularly well or sustainably at the moment, but that doesn't and, and arguably cannot preclude the presence of people and a certain degree of exploitation within these areas. One thing that has been mooted in Scotland, and, and it's not unique to Scotland, is this area of, of cores where you had a wilderness zone and then buffer areas where there was light exploitation. So, you know, a little bit of farming, a little bit of hunting, a little bit of recreation. And then those would be used as reservoirs, if you like, to feed into wider communities. Um, so for me personally, rewilding cannot take place in the absence of people because people won't let it. You know, in, in, at a societal level, certainly in Scotland, if rewilding, it becomes synonymous with the absence of people. And going back to what I said earlier, for, for some people, that is the case. They perceive that rewilding is the clearance as Mark II. It, it's people out and, and nature in, or wolves in predominantly is how they perceive it. Um, and so that's another reason they're fearful of rewilding because it, 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 they think in their mind that it means they will lose their, their way of life, their homes, their livelihoods, their-, their Quote friends. unquote, running people of the land. Exactly, exactly. So even if you had that aspiration, and I don't, but even if you had that aspiration, in the modern world, it's simply not practical to exclude people from the rewilding process. So it has to be an integral part of that journey. We have to initiate the journey and, and perpetuate the journey and benefit from the journey. What, what frustrates me, just to finish off, we, we have this notion, I think, whereby we're faced with this binary choice between nature or people. We can't have both. We have to have one or the other. And if it's nature in, it's people out. If it's people in, then nature doesn't stand a chance. Is that really, is that, is that the most imaginative and creative scenario we can come up with? One or the other, you know, towns with no nature or nature with no people. Is, is that the best we can do? And I think rewilding has to work much harder at, at reframing itself around the notion that actually we can have both. We can have the best of both. And arguably, we can't have one without the other. So I, I think, you know, I mean, even the, even the division between nature and, and, and people is, 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 is flawed because, you know, we are just one mammal species amongst many. So... Yeah, you know, a lot of this is, is a change in mindset. It, it's, and I hate this word reconnecting with nature, but, but rewilding as much as anything else is a, is a philosophical change in perspectives and, and to, to enable us to realize that we are just one species among many. We are no more or less entitled to a healthy and prosperous life than any other species. And I think at the moment we perceive ourselves as separate from nature, here to control it, here to act as owners or tamers of the wild. And going back to the beginning, you know, that's, that's historically what has taken place. We've been encouraged to do exactly that. But here and now, against modern day challenges, I think it's time to, to reconsider or revisit that, that relationship with the natural world. Uh, yeah, I, I just love what you said, that we, we are just one, one of the species. And, and because, and I see that on, on both sides that like that almost humans are treated as something, you know, we were dropped here by aliens all of a sudden and we, oh, we're not natural. Like, oh, of course we're damn natural. We just, 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 just other species. And even, you know, these, these, these areas, these core areas, like my thinking is um, the, obviously the, uh, the human access and the human interactions should be limited in a way right so we don't have a situation where you have this nice wilderness and all of a sudden you have a you know massive footfall and there's a like ton of people go there and and uh, it, 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 it's over but then now arguably i'm i'm a little bit uh, uh just just talking it's not you know embedded into any reality but even if you're you know you don't have motorized access somewhere 
and you you can go in there to camp, but you need to walk 20 miles. And oh, by the way, there is a bear there as well, right? Now it's your choice if you want. If that's your cup of tea, take your backpack, take your bear spray, and go and hike in, and by all means, have a good time. But that naturally will limit the number of people who are willing to, you know, one, able to, and two, willing to, to go there. So, and that's how naturally we can find ourselves like, okay, now I'm in this place and I'm no longer this king of a jungle because guess what? If the grizzly bear goes there, I, I better uh, kind of know my place in a food chain if, if, if that's happened. So, so I love that fact that, that you said this, this, uh, about humans being part of nature. Listen, I want to, um, maybe, maybe now it's the best, best time to jump right into and talk about wolves. That's a big discussion. And we obviously also have these discussions in the a, in a context of Ireland. Um, I almost don't want to bias you and, and start anything. I let you start this this this. this this piece, this segment of the podcast where we talk about wolves and, and then we take it from there. How, how, where it sits in your head? Well, I, I've, got, I've got to be honest. Um, very often I, I start these types of interviews um, and especially with the sort of popular media, as it were, um, I just say, look, if you're going to ask me about wolves, forget it. We're not even going to start because what, what happens, of course, is that they'll speak to me as the, the rewilder and expect me to be very pro-wolf. And then they'll speak to Farmer X down the road and all of a sudden you've got a fight, you've got a conflict. And that's, that's what the media love, of course. They thrive on that. So it's a pointless exercise because it's just feeding division and, and conflict. Um, but as it's you, and I know it's a reasonable and measured question. Oh, thank uh, you, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I, I mean, there's, there's two ways of looking at it. The first way is look, you know, rewilding is, is like baking a cake. We have to go out and get the ingredients. We have to mix the ingredients. We have to put the cake in the oven. And then when the cake comes out the oven, we have to decorate it. If we draw that analogy, wolves is like the cherry on the cake once we've done all the, 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 the previous stuff. It, it's the final piece in the jigsaw. Now, ecologically speaking, it's a very important piece in the jigsaw. Yeah. But again, at a practical level, we could, we could, and you could argue that rewilding is never going to be successful or complete without a complete suite of native species who are able to shape and govern those natural processes that drive vibrant living systems. I get that at an ecological level, absolutely. Um, but at a practical level, again, we could waste a huge amount of time and energy create a huge amount of division and conflict, arguing the toss about whether we should have walls back. So for me, we're just about setting off down to the shops to buy the ingredients. <laughs> um, um, and let's do that first. Let, let's get them back and then let's mix the ingredients and then let's bake the cake and then let's worry about the colour of the decorations we put on top of the cake further down the line. When the conversation is more mature, this ecological awareness and understanding that we we spoke about earlier has matured and evolved over another 5 10 15 years whatever it takes and then let's have a measured let's have a conversation about wolves when it can be genuinely measured respectful and constructive rather than let's have one now and it end up being a conflict and a, and a fight so i think you know for me wolves are an integral part of ecological uh, functionality they are just one species, by the way, so I don't look upon wolves any differently to I look upon red squirrels or wood ants, but they are an integral part of the, of the, the ecological functionality. Um, but I would argue that at a practical level, it's not worth getting bogged down with them right now. There's plenty of other stuff to be getting on with, stuff that isn't that is easy. You know, we, it, it makes sense to pick the low hanging fruit, to, to work where there is common ground rather than trying to battle through the tortuous waters of, <laughs> of, of uncommon ground, you know? So yeah. let, let's make it easy for ourselves and, and take what steps we can easily and practically um, and where everybody, everybody is, is on board. Just, just to finish off that, put wolves aside a little bit. 
in my experience, I've never met anybody who would contest that a, that a vibrant, healthy environment is a good thing. Everybody recognises that that is fundamental to our existence. True. The only, thing, the only reason we're having this conversation, really, is that there is disagreement over what that looks like and, and, and how we get there. And, and in a rewilding context, wolves are a, a real elephant in the room because, yes, ecologically they're important, but they also provide a platform for, for division and conflict. And for the moment, I'd just like to put them back in the cupboard. Let's worry about them a little bit further down the line. Yeah, it's not, it, I, I think it's not common uh, position because like well, what you said, and I, I, I agree with you, that's, I would say, pragmatic position, what you're saying, like, yeah, let's, let's get all these things first before we worry about the wolves. Uh, but I, I don't think that's a common um, view, even among, uh, let's, let's use that phrase, rewilders. Quite often, this is like the first thing you hear, like, oh, we have a wolves back by. We need to talk about wolves. We really need to talk about introducing wolves. And then, then what you're, that's, that's what you're saying. And then the farmer comes back, one and other farmer, with the pictures of the sheep or cattle or horse killed by wolves. It's like, now, this is what you're, and they're like, ah, there's, 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 there's the, the whole thing. Do you feel like this is like, a, is it disappointing to you? Do you think like uh, almost like should be like a inside a rewilding camp conversation sort of like look let's put the wolves uh, like let's not talk about wolves first if we wanted to achieve anything yeah yes i do um but that is easier said than done i, I mean you hear, you hear some you know you hear some rabid perspectives from from farmers from gamekeepers from land managers you hear an equal number of rabid perspectives from from the rewilding community um, I, I, I read some most bizarre and, and ill-informed perspectives. I, I, I really do. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, physically, culturally, economically, we're, we're not yet ready for wolves. The conversation is not mature enough. It's not well-informed enough. It's perhaps not well informed enough in terms of experiences of other countries that are similar to ours. So, as, as you will know, that there are now wolves recolonizing almost every other uh, country in mainland Europe. Let, let's let let's see how that pans out over the next five years in places like Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands. You know, these are crowded places with lots of people with very little wilderness. But if they're left alone wolves will get on with it with life you know they they don't need wildness they need food and they need not to be killed and then they will adapt you know canines are one of the most adaptable species or set of species on the planet so you know it, it's a it's a change in mindset that is required to accommodate wolves not a change in the physical characteristics of the landscape um and so, yeah, I, I think the, the, the conversation around wolves in the UK right now is, is very immature. And when you've got an immature conversation like that, it's easy to grab the headlines. Social media, of course, fuels that whole process. Ah. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it's, it's just unnecessary conflict. I just think we need to be more intelligent about it. Let, let's, think, let's think about what can be done rather than battle over what right now probably can't be done. I would love to see wolves back, but I also recognize, you know, I'd love to see more wood ants. I'd love to see more red squirrels. I'd love to see healthier red deer, more beavers, more woodland, more wetland, more cranes. You know, there's lots and lots of stuff to get on with, none of which is easy or quick. Let, let's forget the cherry on the cake for now. Mm, yeah, it's almost like don't use R word and don't use W word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's the, it's, the, it's, not, not help, it's not healthy to some extent as you actually can't speak of what you want because that's going to... Uh... I, I don't think, sorry, Tommy, I, I don't think we should shy away from the conversation, but let's not let it spiral into, into you know, a political, a politicized and, and, and sort of, 
yeah, just just born out of ill-informed perspectives. Yeah, let's have a fight. Let's not let's 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 not have a fight because, like you like you mentioned, it's always sometimes it's like oh, let's have a fight now over wolves, and you have yeah. this this guy, this guy, and this guy, and they're like ah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I think it's lazy thinking in some ways. You know, um, I just think we, we, we've got to get more. We've got to get cannier about it. We've got to get more intelligence about the conversation. Um, I, I think, to be fair, I mean, I've, I've only got to think. I don't know. I was involved with the early years at, at Allerdale, where you, you may know Paul Lister has the, the plans for a sort of fenced reserve with wolves in it. And, and when I think of some of the things that were going around in the media then about wolves, you know, you'd look at them now and, and, and laugh. Now, there are still people saying these things, but there are less people saying these things because we're becoming better educated. But I think it's a process. It's a journey. We're on it. And we need to let it play out a little bit more before we start having a serious conversation about wolves. Links, on the other hand, different conversation, completely we, different conversation. We're gonna we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about links. That's okay, next sorry. on my list. Uh, <laughs> but I just, just want just want to finish off uh, the wolves. Like uh, uh, I, I think I read it on 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 your website, Scotland, the big picture. There's more wolves in Europe than in the US, which yeah. you. Which I was surprised because, like US, like in my head is like this vast wilderness and all these things, and the wolves in Idaho and all that. I was like, no, it's actually there's there's more of wolves in 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 a Europe and in the US. Another interesting number is like there's more bear in Europe than wolves. I love like bear is my personal favorite. When we talk about rewilding, my bear is my my personal favorite. Uh, you know, I like the the creature itself, but but then also it it part of that is that it seems so, so outlandish. Like, oh, people kind of can't even think about wolves. Like, what about bear? But yet, there's more bear than wolves. I think that part of that is that bear is like you know, bear is quite often this like full cow mode, just eats grass, and that doesn't work with wolves. One question for you, just to finish off with the wolves, and you mentioned, uh, in, in actually there are two things. One is comment and you might want to comment on that or not i think that the islands ireland well great britain and scotland are in a very specific let's say or maybe even unfortunate position that there are islands because the wolves cannot just turn up right and we have this conversation about wolves it's like oh it's a wildlife crime you know like like in Europe, the wolves just show up, like a, a wolf committing wildlife crime just by showing up somewhere. So I think I see this as a big obstacle in a conversation about rewilding in, in the context of, of islands that these animals have to be physically brought by humans. And because of that, okay, we well, need to have all the legislation, permission, this, that, something else. While, and then, like you said, in Belgium and the Holland, is this wolf turns up and it's like, oh, okay, I guess we have a wolf now. And that wolf. And that brought, brings me to another point that you mentioned like, wolves will get on with their life. Even in a, you know, you, you, don't, need to, you don't need a vast wilderness, wolves will just do fine, even in a densely populated or, or relatively densely populated areas. I'm thinking, is that. Uh, is that the wolf population I want from the perspective of rewilding, right? If I'm, if I'm trying to, to put a label on myself, like a hardcore rewilder, is that what I want? Do I want this semi-urban semi, uh, wolf that is sneaking up between the garbage cans? Is, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people, and I'm not suggesting you're one of them, but there are a lot of people with a pretty romantic notion of rewilding, an idealized version of rewilding, if you like. Mm. Again, I, I, again, just from a personal point of view, I think I tend to look at, re, at, at wolves or, or lynx or beavers or wood ants or red squirrels as a component in the system. They're just components in the system. Yeah. But the more components we remove, the less effective the system becomes. So wolves for me are, are the, 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 the repairing or the restoration of a, of a component in the system that is missing and has been missing for some time. I, I don't really care where it lives, how it operates, what it feeds on, you know, as long as it's contributing to the system as, as, 
as with all other species, in, including people. So I, I understand what you mean. I understand we've all seen these, you know, very, very attractive, spectacular visions of, of North America with wolves, bears, with mountain lions, etc. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, having that notion, having that aspiration or something akin to it. But again, at a practical level, um, we're, we're a long way from that. You know, even, 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 even if it was desirable to get there, we're a long way from it being physically possible. Yeah. So for, for me, you know, it, it's all about how does the system work? What is the efficiency of the ecological engine? What are the bits that are missing? What are the bits in disrepair? And how can we restore and recover those bits to make the engine work better? So I personally don't mind whether wolves are howling from the tops of Scottish mountains or, you know, at the bottom of my garden. Um, it, it's the fact that they're there and they're present and they're playing their role. Just very as, long, as long as they're playing their role, right? Because it almost feels like in some of these cases, like you said, like there has to be a system and the wolves are part of, the, of that system playing their role. Now, when I'm thinking about these wolves and these urban areas, it's almost like there's no system. There are just wolves missing the system, trying to adapt to what they have, scavenging and, and, and that. It just this argument doesn't really sit well with me of like, oh, they can just do fine with the humans. Like, yeah, they're missing the system. I feel like they're missing the system. Yeah, I, I, I know what you feel like, I, I get that. But, but again, what, what you're doing there is separating the realm of wolves in some sort of pristine wilderness with the realm of people. You're drawing that line between people and nature. And, and I would argue, you know, whether it's wolves, whether it's beavers, whether it's woodland, whether it's flower meadows, we've got to, we've got to work towards blurring those lines. Um, from an ecological point of view, in terms of connectivity, um, in terms of habitat expansion, but also at a psychological point of view, we, we've got to get away from this notion that when we as people want to experience nature what we do is get in our cars and drive to it <laughs> you know and then we, we we go through the gate that says nature reserve this way <laughs> you have you know you have your bit of nature and then you come back to normal life yes you know that that just doesn't make sense and, and I, i would argue it's not healthy so those lines have got to be blurred and and if that means wolves wandering in and out of our space then I would argue that's, that's a good thing. Um, and, and it, you know, it is already happening in, in many parts of Europe. There are very few parts of certainly Western Europe that are the wilderness that you've described. And yet there are wolves, bears, lynx, wolverine in some cases, beavers, et cetera, et cetera, living quite happily alongside, as you said, pretty densely populated countries. Yeah, yeah. It almost sometimes feel like that would be easier to, to uh, rather than blur the lines to reinforce them. Like, here is this wilderness, okay? This is like b w wolves, beavers, bears domain. Beware. And this is like your, all the rest of your stuff. Now you can do whatever you want. Like, sometimes it feels like it would be easier. But I get, what you're, I get what you're saying. That's, I guess, not the idea of rewilding. Um, let's talk about links then. Okay, well, the first thing to say is that, you know, again, the, the argument, such as, such as it is, tends to be around large carnivores or apex predators, as they're called, and, and wolves, lynx, and bears get lumped into the same argument. Lynx and wolves are very, very, very different animals. Um, and again, I think it's, it's, it's telling that they do get lumped together with wolves because actually most people know very, very little about lynx. They're very shy, secretive, medium-sized cats. They're ambush hunters. They're not pack animals. They're socially isolated. They have huge ranges. If you had, I don't know, let's say for the sake of argument, 100 lynx in Scotland today, you know, the number of actual sightings on a, on a daily or weekly basis would be virtually zero. They're very, very elusive. That's their important. whole point, right? They're they're hiding. They're, they're, this is their this is a life history strategy. They just know, like <laughs> pretend they're not there. Yeah, e exactly. Whereas wolves, you know, they're pack animals. They're social animals. They hunt in a very very different way. Um, lynx need woodland. They're ambush hunters. They need cover to ambush their prey. They have quite a 
specific diet. They, they feed predominantly on medium-sized deer. In Scotland, that would be predominantly roe deer and, and red deer calves and hinds. Um, and they just go about their business in a very, very secretive way. So, you know, the discussion around wolves is a very separate discussion mm -hmm. um, to that ar around lynx. People and tend to lump them together because these are creatures with claws. These are their ah, creatures. So. Yeah, and, and they will have an impact on livestock. There's, there's no doubt about that. There will be, so to speak, casualties uh, as a result of lynx. Um, the question is, at a societal level, you know, is that a price worth paying? Is, is that too high a price or is it a price worth paying? And, and I think the answer to that, to some degree, depends on when you're talking about bringing lynx back. Because at the present time, there is an argument to say sheep that, um, predominantly sheep that graze near woodland are at risk. I, I think that's a valid argument from, from a sheep farmer's point of view. There are extreme cases in Norway where, where sheep are extensively grazed in forests where there are significant casualties as a result of sheep, as a result of lynx. Um, but for the most part in the UK, sheep are grazed in, in open pasture. And, and once they're in open pasture, as is borne out by experiences in other countries, that they're, they're pretty safe from lynx. Lynx do not hunt across large areas of open yeah. ground. Um, so, you know, uh, it, lynx come with a certain degree of baggage, nowhere near the amount of, of baggage that wolves come with. So it is a more... It's a, it's a, it's, if we're talking about large predator reintroduction, it's a much more sensible, pragmatic option at, at this stage. Um, and there are opportunities around links, of course, as, as much as anything else. So, um, yeah, but, but, but fundamentally, and, and the, the argument you put forward about islands and the, physical, the need to physically bring animals back is very valid and is equally valid for links as it is wolves. You know, it, it's a major psychological obstacle to overcome to physically pick an animal up and bring it somewhere and all the media storm that would go with that than an animal yeah. effectively slipping over a border into a, into a new country. So, yeah, the, the fact of the matter is that there are now lynx, wolves and bears living in every mainland European country. Britain or Great Britain or, or the, the collective islands of, of Great Britain and, and Ireland are, are part of only a very, very small handful of countries refusing to live with lynx. It isn't that we can't. There is plenty of food. There is plenty of habitat. It, it is that we won't. Right now, we won't. And I would argue that just put the ecological considerations aside and look at the morality of that, how can we reasonably expect India to live with tigers, Africa to live with lions, Europe to live with wolves, bears and lynx, and we refuse to accommodate them here? Mm -hmm. that, that is illogical and irrational. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think there's a moral argument. There's, a, there's an economic argument, which we probably won't go into, as well as the ecological argument. Yeah. What is the economical argument? Let's, let's go into it. Well, I'll just cite you one case study um, in Germany um, where, where there are lynx, but they're not plentiful. They're not plentiful anywhere. And the chances of seeing one are, are pretty small. Yeah. But the town in, um, oh, oh, I know what it's called, called Bad Schandau. And the branding of that town revolves ex almost exclusively around lynx. This is the town of the lynx. There's a 40 foot banner on the town hall there's lynx merchandise everywhere there's lynx footprints on all of the pav pavements the chances of actually seeing a lynx pretty slim but the notion that this is a landscape in sufficiently rich in nature to support lynx creates um creates an attraction in its own right so i think the presence of lynx is, is actually a valuable economic commodity put aside their 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 economic uh, impact on, 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 on deer. You know, we spend a huge amount of money on, on culling and managing deer, especially roe deer. Um, lynx do that for free, 24-7, 365. But putting that aside, there, there is an opportunity through nature-based tourism. Yes, yes, good point. And do you, do you think how realistic it is to, you said it's like it's a different, it's a different story. So I presume 
you're not treating links like oh let's not talk about links right now that's so maybe that's a question do you think it's it's we can talk about links right now or they're uh, you know a little bit like wolves maybe in the box that is slightly closer to where we're going to deal with that but it's still too early no i don't think it's too early i think beavers have been a, a real um stepping stone if you like to the to the concept of reintroductions and don't get me wrong beavers are not without their 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 issues um on their own and, and ditto sea eagles which you know scotland reintroduced i know ireland has as well so none of these things are straightforward and, and without some degree of of, uh, of division and conflict but links is a conversation we can have in fact um very early in the new year scotland the big picture in partnership with two other conservation groups are starting a, a year-long social feasibility study to effectively ask the question and be able to evidence the question, um, is Scotland ready for links? Apart from anything else, that will do away with all the anecdotal conversations that, that, that I had. Um, and it will provide, if it's a positive response, and it may not be, but if it's a positive response, it will provide a foundation for an official reintroduction. So the first stage in any reintroduction is, is an ecological assessment. Can this landscape support this animal? That work has already been done, but also a social um, feasibility assessment. Are people ready to live alongside this animal, whether it's beavers or lynx? So we have to do that work regardless. It may be that at the end of next year, if we're having another conversation, I say to you, we've done the study and you know, 70% of people don't want links, in which case it's dead in the water. Mm -hmm. But if 70% of people do want links, then it's a different kettle of fish. And there, there are then grounds for an official license application to reintroduce them. So we're not there yet. We have to take it step by step. But it is a conversation that is being had and come the new year will be had, um, you know, across mainstream media. So... Yeah watch this space yeah i would love to talk to you a year from now about it and see how it how it plays out um listen so so to that point we were talking about a little bit of uh you know what we want wolves links we want them to be back but you mentioned beavers that's that's the dull the deal done done deal right we have beavers back in scotland how did that work out and how does that situation looks like Another yeah. controversy, I know, like, it, like whatever, whatever species we're going to like, it's a controversy. Wolves, no, let, better not talk about wolves. Lynx, um, yeah, we don't know, like, beavers, they're already back. Oh, God damn it, beavers. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we really do make life complicated. <laughs> so um, just very quickly, the story with beavers is that there is, um, there is an official reintroduction on the west coast of Scotland, which... Um, it's called the Scottish Beaver Trial. That was a five-year research study, two million pounds, and there are now roughly 20 beavers living quite happily and quite legally uh, on the west coast of Scotland. In parallel with that, um, around the Tay catchment in, in central Scotland, there was a so-called illegal beaver release, um, which, means, which means there are now roughly five or six hundred beavers leave, living across yes. central Scotland. Was that, was that this, this uh, Gove guy who released those beavers? Is that the thing we're talking about? No, no, no. You have to be careful. You'll get, you'll get locked up in prison. So Michael Gove is, or was um, the, the, the environment minister for, for England. So he was receptive to the idea of beavers. Oh, okay, don't, okay. don't let it get out that he, he let the cage up. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, there are... Yeah, it's, it's irrelevant who did it and how it was done and all the rest of it. But the, the, the net result is that there are quite a lot of beavers living in central Scotland. Now, the government has now recognised that and have now effectively included those beavers um, in the official reintroduction. And, and beavers are now a protected species across Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot still being shot, but that's, that's a different story. Um, meanwhile, there, are, there is one... Uh, population of free living beavers in England, down in Devon, and there are a very rapidly growing number of managed beaver populations across England. These are predominantly um, fenced wetland areas, quite big areas, um, five, ten hectares in many cases, 
And the idea really is to explore the impact of beavers, not, on a, not only on the ecological condition of the land, but also to explore whether they are a natural solution to flood management. Mm. Um, so beaver talk, so to speak, is, is growing rapidly. And, and I actually see a situation potentially where there might be more free living beavers in England um, than there are in Scotland quite, quite quickly uh, if the present direction of travel continues. Uh -huh. So, yeah, I, I think that beavers will serve as a, as a, as a litmus test as much as anything um, for, the, for the tolerance or, or intolerance towards lynx. Um, mm -hmm. ah. Yeah, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's a, it, 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 on the one hand, it's a slow process and seems to take forever. But on the other hand, the conversations around beavers and lynx and rewilding and ecological restoration and nature recovery, you know, th those conversations are evolving and maturing almost daily, very, very yeah. quickly. Would you, would you describe beavers as a rewilding success story or is it too far? Uh, you mean, is it too early? Is it, or, is it, or maybe too early? I don't know. Is it too far? Is it too early? Well, I, I mean... I'm, if I quote one site that has had beavers in a managed environment, but now have them living wild in central Scotland, I, I won't name the estate. Some people will know where it is, but you know, they're, they're 20 years down the line of having beavers. So they've had chance to do what beavers do. And if you go and visit this place, it, it is mind blowing what these animals have done. Um, I would call it, you know, exciting ecological change. Others might call it damage. Um, but, but there's no doubt about the change in the landscape is significant in the presence of beavers. So, um, you know, they're, a, they're an animal that will have a very, very significant physical impact. And again, you know, how is that going to pan out in terms of our perceptions and attitudes towards that impact? Because it does look a bit chaotic, the work of beavers. You know, it creates a huge amount of habitat and, and niches for, for all manner of species. But at, a, at an aesthetic level, it looks messy. So it'll be interesting when that starts panning out across, you know, the, the leafy suburbs of southern England, how, how, the, yeah. how the residents perceive yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, interesting. Why, why are you reluctant to name the place? Do you want to just not reveal the place so that people not come back and, 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 and ruin the, the place? Or is it like, it's controversial that it's happening there and better not talk no, about it? No, the, the only reason is that I don't want people to jump to a conclusion that this is where the beavers were released. Illegal. Okay. So okay. Okay. I'm trying to avoid litigation. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> she, leaders is like, it feels like a... It should be like a relaxed conversation about animals. And it's like, <laughs> it's like a minefield, like let's do this and that. <laughs> it's unfortunate, it's unfortunate. Not 90% of, of what I deal with on a daily basis is what you might call people politics. Yeah. It, it's, it's all about that change and control and power and influence and perspectives and attitudes and priorities and motivations. Yeah. It's all about people. Yeah, and you're doing that full time? Yeah, I'm doing it full time. I, I don't get paid to do it full time, but it's it's my, without sounding too pretentious about it, I feel it's my calling in life. I don't know how many years I've got left, but I'd I'd like to to make a you know a, a, a tangible and positive difference to to the um, you know to to Scotland's ecological um, functionality or authenticity or integrity. Call it what you will. Wow, wow I, you man. Know, that cool. that makes my job. I'm in the rewilding space. I, I don't, I'm not passionate about the word rewilding, but I'm in that space and, and that's where yeah. I see my, my, my work. Wow, man, kudos for that. Um, and so maybe the last one, we, you mentioned sea eagles. Like what's that, what's that story? <laughs> Is it controversial again? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, you know, if you look at it from an ecological point of view, uh, the, the reintroduction of sea eagles, which, which started in 1975, has, has been a huge success. You know, there were, I don't know how many birds there were originally, 30, let's say. Um, there are now upwards of 120 breeding pairs, probably another 200 juveniles. So there are a lot more sea eagles around than there were 30 years ago. That's a, that's a simple fact, and that is a, a conservation or ecological success. Um, as they find their way to places where they've not been seen in generations mm -hmm. and, and places that are 
culturally managed, predominantly for farming, there is conflict. Um, you know, we, next month we're publishing a story of an interview I did with a, with a sheep farmer on the west coast of Scotland. And this is not a rabid, you know, right wing farmer. You know, it's not a typical sort of stereotypical farmer as people would perceive it. This is an intelligent, reasonable, rational, measured individual who likes seagulls. He understands that, that they are popular with wider society. He's not suggesting that we wipe them out, but he is suggesting that they're having an impact on his business. And, and how can solutions be arrived at whereby that impact can be minimized or mitigated? So it, it's quite interesting if you read the story, um, it gives you an insight into the way it looks from a farmer's point of view. So, you know, we can look at seagulls and hail their success and celebrate their success. And, and there are many, many people that do that, millions of people that do that. Um, but there are people on the other side of the coin who are adversely affected by, by their presence. And the same would be, will be true of beavers, is true of beavers. The same will be true of, of lynx. You know, from a rewilder's point of view, there's no merit in um, and no fairness in, in ignoring alternative perspectives. We've got to listen to those concerns. And in some cases, they won't be able to be addressed. But in other cases, with creativity, with collaboration, they will. And I think, you know, from a rewilding perspective, moving away from that sort of purest extreme, we've got to accept that animals come with baggage. And for some people, they come with an unacceptable level of baggage. So, you know, if you take beavers, for example, we've got to accept that in some cases, beavers have to be culled, they have to be managed. The same will be true of, of carnivores. We, we have to acknowledge that there are legitimate concerns among land managers. Some of those concerns are unreasonable, no doubt about that. Um, but ignoring them is just gonna drive it underground and ultimately result in illegal persecution. And that's the situation nobody wants to arrive at. So pragmatism, I, I think for, for me, for Scott and the big picture, we have a set of ideals, we have a set of principles, we're passionate about those principles and passionate about promoting them across wider society. But those principles do not stand in isolation. They cannot ignore equally felt passionate principles on the part of other people. There has to be common ground, there has to be a meeting point, and we have to listen to each other because otherwise we go back to having a fight on social media and that's yeah. fruitless and, and saps energy. Absolutely. No, no, you you're, you're have a very, very reasonable and, and valid points. Uh, Peter, um, we're just going to be wrapping this up. I have one more uh, for you uh, and just more relaxed at the end. Maybe relaxed because it's so outrageous to some. Um, what would, would you, I would like to hear your comment on, and this is among rewilding also, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that, people talking about, well, we really should reintroduce megafauna as well put the elephants into American plains to, you know, make up for mastodons and really rewilding not gonna be completed when we're gonna bring back the, you know, massive herbivores and you know, hear that argument like, oh, this and that plant is out of balance because they're not being grazed by mastodons or mammoths. And like, oh, we almost have a mammoth's back and like all, all, these, all these conversations just, you know, what 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 your what your is it is it is it really fun thing to do uh, to think of and that's it is it something that if rewilding movement is successful you know 150 years from now maybe or is it like ah it's just a waste of time what's uh maybe something else yeah, I, I, again, I, I hate. I preface that, that that this is outrageous. Like I know, like we don't, we not talk, we're not suggesting we're putting mastodons or elephants into Scotland. It's just, but it's just a fun conversation. I think. Yeah, I, I think there, there. I mean, for me, <clears throat> it's a bit like wolves at, at the moment. That 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 conversation, I've heard it. it it's a distraction, you know. D just put it back in the cupboard. Let let's have it over a beer sometime in <laughs> ten years in the future. Whatever. I, I think the other the other. The other just slightly more serious point is that 
although I'm very comfortable with the word rewilding, and, and don't get me wrong, we need to work hard at reframing what it means and the benefits that it provides. But equally, lots and lots of people, especially young people, are really excited about it. So I am very comfortable with the word rewilding, apart from the first two letters, because the re bit implies that we're going back in history to recreate something. Ah, that fantastic. And then, yes. of course, the question is, how far back? And, and are we going back to the you know, post-glacial post times? Or are we going back to the times of saber-toothed tigers, etc.? And of course, there's no answer to that question. So if, if I had a concern about rewilding, it, it, it's that for me, it's not about going back because we can't, even if we wanted to, we can't. It's all about looking forward. So I like the wilding bit. The re-bit kind of, it, it, it misleads people because, you know, as I say, for, for, for Scott the big picture anywhere, Anyway, rewilding is very much about looking forward, looking for solutions to some of the challenges that we've spoken about um, that, will, that will serve not only an ecologically richer country, but will serve people economically, socially and culturally. So I, I just haven't got the time or energy to get involved in conversations about digging up DNA from you know, tundra fields in Siberia and doing whatever the black magic scientists do. Let, right here, right now, in Scotland, let's get some trees in the ground. For, you know, that we are one of the most de-wooded countries in Europe. Let's start with that. Let's start with more squirrels. Let's think about connectivity. Let's restore degraded peatlands to store carbon. Let's talk about reintroductions, not wolves, not elephants, not saber-toothed tigers, but, but practical solutions. Because there's so much of that to go on with the elephants just, you know, they, they, they just, yeah. they just blow my mind because I can't go there. I just can't go. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank you. If it's Thank a conversation, it, it's one for other people to have, and I'll, I'll leave it to that. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Peter, how do you see the, how do you see the future? How do you see the, fu how do you see the future uh, pan out? I, I'm presuming that you're optimistic because obviously you wouldn't be doing that full time if you wouldn't believe in it, and if you wouldn't believe in the success. What's a, what's the time frame? Is it 50 years? Is it 30 years? Is it 100 years? How would you see well, that it, playing out? It, it depends on, on when you say time frame to, to get to what. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here in the Cairngorms surrounded by rewilding action, surrounded by a, rewild, a, a landscape that is being managed by according to rewilding principles. And it's happening now. You know, it is, you know, next year the trees will be higher. Next year, there'll be more wood ants, there'll be more squirrels. So the time frame for some things is very, very short. In terms of where we need to get to, well, of course, where we need to get to will depend on who you're asking. Um, but, but there's no doubt about it. Restoring landscape scale ecological processes takes time. It's taken a long time to dewild the country. You know, it's been a sort of a... Um, a sort of death by a thousand cuts, if you like, and it will take a long time to restore it to whatever we want it to look like, you know, long after my life has ended. So it, going back to your question, I am optimistic and, and rewilding at the moment is a massively exciting arena full of opportunities. And part of my job is trying to keep the team that I work with focused because you could just get pulled in every, all sorts of directions. There's so much going on. But for me at a personal level, when I get out of bed in the morning, there's a choice. I do nothing or I do something. And I try to do something. And that's all any of us can do. And we can't get overly bogged down or depressed with stuff that we have no control over. We can only deal with what we can control ourselves. And I would just urge everybody to do what they can to things that they control, their, that, that they can control themselves. Because those bigger threats... Um, at a global level, you know, it, it, it takes individual actions to deal with global problems. And, and we can all do our bit, whether you have a window box in your, in your flat or you have a garden or you have 20,000 acres in the Scottish Highlands or, or, or in Ireland or whatever. We can all do our bit to, to work towards that healthier environment that we all agree is a good thing. 
let, let's not get bogged down with the with with all the you know the other baggage alongside Let, let's focus on that speaking about doing something so how people can support your work and what they can do to do that something if they want to do something yeah i mean there's a whole load of stuff that they can do if, if they want to go on at our website which is three w scotland big um i hope there's a lot of information on there th- ways you can get involved in rewilding a lot of information about rewilding Um, you can, of course, donate to, to our cause or, or lots of other causes. Um, but there, there's a role for everybody. And, and if, you know, if anybody has any specific queries, then my email address is on the, on the website. So by all means, get in touch. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, just to close that off, is, is there anything that you feel we should talk about and we didn't or maybe any, any closing words for our listeners? I, I'm, I'm sitting here feeling pretty exhausted. I need, I need, I need a coffee. So if, if our listeners are feeling the same, we, we maybe just leave it at that. Because I think, you know, rewilding is a multifaceted, exciting, but multifaceted and complex social movement, as well as an ecological movement. There's lots of angles to it. There's lots of perspectives to it. I think there is a case for, you know, almost having these conversations subject by subject rather than wrapping you up in a in a in a big um in a big sort of container so to speak because there is a lot in there so I, i i feel reluctant to bludgeon the listeners with with any more information at this stage i think there's enough to digest gotcha peter uh thank you very much appreciate your time likewise good to meet you see you later see you